morning. Uh, firstly, please, uh, I uh, want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we meet here, uh, past, present and future. And uh, certainly uh, great to see and also a shout out to the Transport for New South Wales. I've been involved with all their consultation to date and the commitment to collaboration and co-creation has really set the bar high, but also the learnings that they have for other jurisdictions of the feedback from industry and, and the industry was deep in, in feedback from a tier one contractor, tier three contractor and everything in between was uh, an immense conversation to be a part of. So um, I commend uh, them for that, that exercise. Now, today I was going to have a different title of a, of a presentation, but I thought it was better to talk about a more positive future around what can happen if you try. So this is a bit of our journey and our lessons learned and things that maybe others can take away on the things that they can do in their organisation. Uh, next slide. Uh, a community can't thrive if the world around it doesn't. At Lindley's, we take that responsibility uh, to the planet very seriously. That's why we're embarking on Mission Zero. We are a 1.5 degree aligned company. We have set ourselves ambitious science-based emissions reduction targets. Our commitment is to absolute zero by 2040, no offsets. There is an interim target of net zero by 2025, scope one and two, and some are parts of our business, including our construction business here in Australia, already achieved that in 2021. But the 2040 target is no small ambition. Next slide, please. Our targets are, next slide. Yeah, thanks. Uh, our targets are very bold, um, but they're more than just headlines. We've done a lot of work to look at our operationalizing those targets through developing and launching our regional Mission Zero roadmaps, outlining our emissions initiatives to reduce our scope one, two and three carbon emissions in line with our targets. We've done a lot of work to provide guidance around what's actually an appropriate additionality and uh, permanence around offsets and also the credibility around renewable energy, electricity procurement. And there's a lot of work to go in a deeper dive on our scope three measurement and reporting as well. Next slide, please. Your roadmaps, uh, our roadmaps can be found on our Lendless website. This is just an Australia summary. There's a global summary and a regional summary for every part of our business globally. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I'm actually going to single out some actions we're already taking. The key bit I wanted to take away from that um, is that scope three, in terms of that specific area, is 80% of our footprint. And so there's a lot of activity, obviously, in there, given we will have an absolute commitment to zero carbon by 2040. Um, this is a roadmap that it represents the commitments of the construction business, the development and the investment and asset portfolio sides of the business. So it's all parts of the lend -lease machine globally. Next slide, please. So, so I'm going to step through what we're doing in each of the scopes. And I think it's worthwhile having a, a bit of a broader lens around what we're doing. Um, these are just some examples of things we're doing across the world, whether that's the UK, and I'm very jealous of them, they've already been implementing alternative fossil fuels and eliminating those from their sites um, uh, on all of their construction sites. So they're doing some pretty cool things. We're going to get there very soon in terms of the work that we're doing here in Australia, and soon you'll hear more about that. So I'm not going to go into much more detail now about that. Uh, next one. We've also done some very collaborative work with the University of Queensland to understand what are the challenges for construction equipment and machinery and what kind of pace and acceleration do we need to achieve our absolute zero emissions by 2040. Um, so there's a lot of work being done there and highlighting that electrification is our preference, um, but our backup is renewable diesel because the electrification is going to take some time. We have zero uh, signals in market in terms of investment for the construction industry around electrification of construction equipment. It doesn't sit within a light vehicle EV policy process and renewable diesel hasn't had the support or bear shout out to Queensland government because of starting to support that activity. And so we're starting to see a transition there, but we've got a long way to go because the scale of the transition is huge. Next slide, please. We've also worked with the Green Building Council on this using those insights to inform a new best practice approach to fossil fuel free construction. My posing question for this audience and for those uh, trying to set their own policy guidance on, what can we achieve by 2030? How much electrification or removal of fossil fuels can we do and achieve by, by that period? We think quite a lot. I'll leave you with that for thought. Um, we also know that the Brisbane 2032 Legacy Project Roadmap that I participated in actually flagged that as a key opportunity 
around an all-electric, green where possible, construction plan equipment for games infrastructure, and a 2030 target, including the electrification for construction plant equipment for games contractors. This totally lines up with that community. Just needs to be taken forward in terms of uh, transitioning to policy and procurement. Next stage. Next slide. Also doing a lot of things to improve our operational energy efficiency, both in the construction phase as well as the operational assets. Um, so there's lots of things occurring there in terms of the switching to renewable electricity, the transition of gas to assets, um, and as I said before, the, the building business has already um, been a renewable electricity uh, accounting for all that on projects in Australia since last year. Next slide, please. In terms of scope three, we're doing an awful lot here that highlights um, a very in, in deep conversation we've been having with our supply chain and sourcing and procuring low body carbon materials. Things like uh, concrete, where we've gone and achieving 40% uh, of Portland cement replacement across all of our uh, three residential towers at one city harbour, that's actually delivering a 10% reduction in embodied carbon emissions alone. This uh, picture is actually from New York. Uh, New York? Yes, yes, New York. Um, the reason I wanted to include this was it's a demonstration of recycled steel. 97% of the steel used has post-consumer recycled content, resulting in a 27% reduction in body carbon. We'd love to be able to do that, that here. We also are doing a lot of work in looking at our um, continued application of mass engineered timber, um, taking on board with what the 20 or so projects we've done globally, including 25 King here in Brisbane, uh, currently you know, 45 metres tall and one of the most significant mass engineered office, tower, um, office uh, buildings in Australia, and soon to be hopefully taken over by others that are taking that to the next level and learning from what we've done. Uh, next slide, please. Aluminium glass is a, another really important part of our scope through decarbonisation. Um, it's a very complex trade, has lots of different parts to it. And so we've been working very closely with suppliers around this particular area. Um, two examples here, I thought we're sharing one, what we're achieving in the UK market and obviously uh, doing some amazing things because of the availability of uh, particular um, supply of uh, materials over there. But also once in Harbour, we've managed to now start to really turn the dial. It did take three goes. I think the first time uh, they said, you can't be serious. The second tender, maybe they are serious, but we're just throwing a number. The third time, oh my God, they really are serious and they're not going to let this go. And we managed to you know, procure that aluminium uh, at, a, at a commercial rate that actually meant that the industry was really stepping up. But it took three goes around realising that we weren't going to let that go and we were committed to it. There's a fantastic spotlight on aluminium that Mecca has done, and I encourage you to watch that. Uh, and in fact, it's a great spotlight on timber and low body carbon as well, which have a lot more deep, deeper dive on these stories. But it's about persistence, clarity of requests, and collaboration with supply chain. It's not going to happen without that with their participation. Next slide, please. Thought I'd share where we think the trajectory of embodied carbon by 2030 is looking like going. Right now, good practice and best practice are starting to highlight that we're, we're pretty much getting to 40% now. So what can we achieve by 2030 um, is really posing a, a really interesting question. We can see a mass adoption of products and services, realising that they need, need to have credible back backup and third-party evidence of their credentials, that's absolutely going to be the, the game. We, we can't rely on half-truths or half-reports or only one particular indicator. We need all the environmental indicators that gives us a, a credible baseline to include within our life cycle assessments. Next slide. At that point, it's highlighting that, you know, where's, where is the Green Star Tools going? And aligned with our, you know, my suggestion there, can we get to 2050? Well, Bench, best practice benchmark for 2030 is 40% already in the Green Star tool, following that. So 2050 maybe not much of as big a stretch as we think. Next slide. So to chair now, what are the type of key actions that we need to support the industry and have the right signals? Because we really are ready. We're already doing this in the private sector. There is a disparity, as you probably heard already, between what's already happening in the private sector and some government circles, but also what's not happening in other circles. So clearly the first step is really building that capacity in education to understand what all these terms mean. Scope one, two, and three didn't really exist as a, a language vernacular in our industry until a couple of years ago. But now it's actually central to our roadmaps, our action plans on decarbonisation, 
it has to be part of your own organization's understanding of this, this transition. Um, and also, and Holly said this too, uh, market signals to suppliers to help them work out where they need to invest and allow the wagons of the world and others to scale up investments because they can see a pipeline of opportunity. At the moment, it's kind of one-offs here and one-offs there. We actually need to have a robust looking at the pipeline of what commitments are being made into the future. Those setting embodied carbon targets, but also minimums. Let's bring up all projects and not have this, uh, this threshold that says we only care about the projects over $100 million or something like that. We actually can do a lot on every project and there's a minimum that any project can do. So there is, you know, needing to do the bottom up as well as the, as, as well as the leading practice. Um, with that early engagement and early supply chain involvement through those uh, collaborative models are really essential so we can actually do that collaboratively. There is so much of that risk transfer thing happening late in, in the game and there's no time, there's no value cost, there's no way to do those when you're actually too late into the, into the process. And certainly if you're doing life cycle assessments to inform how far you're going with your embodied carbon actions, then that needs to be part of the early part of the design process, not trying to tick what you might have done uh, at the back end of it. It's really got to be part of that really history early concept decision making. So you can decide whether the adaptive reuse of that structure, that facade, is making a significant impact compared to what you might otherwise do in terms of a new build. Uh, next slide, please. So I also almost there wanted to share this because these are five cities around the world that are demonstrating leadership around decarbonisation in construction. They set uh, specific targets around embodied emissions across buildings and infrastructure and also across the, the use of zero emissions construction machinery, both at the 2030 and the 2050 level. And as a leading city um, in the future, as an Olympic city, and Los Angeles, one of those, there's, there's five cities there you can learn from in terms of where they're going. And we're certainly participating in that. And there's a future C40 Cities event coming up in the next uh, month or so. So that's an opportunity to commit to that type of activity rather than seeing that we're not going to get there and having to rely on offsets to, um, to net out our emissions. Last slide. And... So, I'll give you a bit of a summary of the one, two, and three actions that we're doing across our, our, our roadmap and highlighting that, well, you know, this can be, uh, can be done. We're actually doing a lot of actions today that others can follow. Um, our Mission Zero moonshot will only be achieved, though, through radical collaboration, radical tra transparency around what we're achieving, and also a rapid uh, radical acceleration. Um, but there's also another key part to this, and that's, if you just click the button one more time, please. Mm -hmm. It's about also the collective we, because we need everyone on board. We need to co-create our future and collaborate to make this happen. So hopefully you can join me and get on the roadmap to a, a net zero or an absolute zero emissions pathway. Thanks. Mm -hmm.